So first of all, thanks uh, the organizers for this workshop. I'm uh, very grateful every, uh, and I'm so I'm also very impressed by the university and the city. So, so I'm very happy to hear. And also thanks, Xinhan, uh, for the nice introduction. You should have done that, shouldn't you? Know? <laughs> okay. So <coughs> today I talk about a. Uh, uh, some isoparametric ratio over scale fraction conform classes. Okay. So I will give the introduction first, and then in the second half of the talk, you can you know skip the details. But I'm going to do it anyway. So okay. So let's recall what is the isoparametric inequality. Okay. So you are in the plane, right? So you draw a region. So you know what's the uh, parameter of the domain, and you know what's the area of the domain. Okay. And then. This two quantity has a uh, inequality, so L squared bigger than or equal to four pi A L is a parameter. Uh, uh, L is a parametric, and R A is area. Okay. Okay. So this is in two D. Okay. So it also has a high D uh, version. Okay. And the power is because of the scaling, and the inequality is achieved by the balls. Okay. So this is true for the domains on the Euclidean space. Okay, and then there are so then people may ask, okay, how about you give me region on surfaces? Okay, so Carmen was the first one to prove the isoparametric inequality for domains simply connected domains on minimal surfaces. Okay, and he proved the minimum uh, the the inequality by proving the inequality one here for every holomorphic function on the unit ball. Okay, so for this inequality, you think of like you give me an f. On the uh, on the boundary, you have an extension to, to be the holomorphic function over the whole ball, okay. And then this, you know, for minimal surface, you mean which means you know k one equals minus k two, so their product is negative, okay. So this inequality is also true on surfaces with uh, negative Gaussian curvature, okay. This was proved by someone else, okay. But you know, we are most interested in the inequality one, okay. And there's also uh, another work by Jacob. Jacob extend the uh, inequality one to general domains. You replace B by any other domain, but the constant will be different. Constant will be different. Okay, I, I didn't do anything. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, for one is optimal. Yeah, but for general one, we we will see. Okay. Okay. So if you write f to be you know, exponential to another function, then you take the norm, so it will be exponential w, for example, or w plus iv, so uh, the inequality will become this, okay? So I'm used to, you know, in this form, okay? So in 2D, we use exponential, okay? And w will be a harmonic function, okay? And you also think about, think of this, you give me a function on the boundary of the ball, you do a harmonic extension, okay? Then you have this inequality. Okay, this is like harmonic extension. Okay, and uh, I write in this form because it has the following three uh, observations, and which will be related to the others. Okay, so first, so you can think of the the left hand side. You have the integrand exponential two w. You can think of this uh, a new metric. Okay, which is uh, just the exponential 2w times the Euclidean metric, okay? So this metric has a count as zero a Gauss curvature if and only if w is harmonic. Okay, these two are equivalent. And moreover, the left-hand side, left-hand side is the area of the ball under this new metric, and the right-hand side is a parametric of the, just the length of the boundary under the new metric, okay? So this this metric is a little bit uh, special just because you know a metric is like a matrix. Right? It's a two by two matrix, right? So this new metric is differed by just divided by a function. Okay, so it's just a function times a matrix. Okay, and moreover, this function is positive. So we call such matrix are conformal. Okay, so two matrix are conformal, which means they just differ by a function, not differ by a matrix. Okay. So okay, so this story for two D, okay, and then that story for Kama, and then there are two papers by 
Hanfeng Bo, Wang Xiaodong, Ying Xiaodong. Okay, they study high dimensional generalization of these uh, inequalities. Okay, so they did two papers. The first one is uh, they generalize the common inequality on the ball, but in higher Euclidean space. Okay, and the second one they did on the uh, you know manifold. Okay, so we will do the uh, basically our work is uh, on the second one. Okay, you will see. So you know there are many Han, Wang, Yan in China, right? So well, these are the full names of. Them. Okay, so. Two of them are uh, two of them are my friends. Okay. So, so, so the following is what they, what they did. Okay. So in Rn you have the Euclidean ball. Okay. You give me a function v on the boundary of the ball. You do a harmonic extension. Okay. And then this function v will satisfy the inequality. Okay. And the constant is sharp. Okay. And we know uh, when for what kind of V will satisfy the equality. Okay, so everything is done here. Okay. And uh, it also has uh, three corresponding remarks. Okay. The first one, you can think of the left hand side and right hand side are the area of the boundary and the volume of the ball under the new metric, okay, which is a V for over and minus two times the Euclidean metric. So again, this new metric is conformal to the Euclidean because it, it, it just differed by positive function. Okay. And uh, the scalar curvature of this is zero if and only if V is harmonic. Okay. So, and then they also consider uh, generalization on manifold. Okay. And the manifold, so you take the, you consider the ratio, okay, the volume divided by the area of the boundary, and you have to do scale, you, they should be in different power because of the scaling, okay. And then they do the, the take, take the supremo over the conformal matrix such that the scalar curvature is zero, okay. This is, uh, you know, generalization to what I just mentioned. And the bracket G is just denoted by the conformal class of the metric. This is a common notation in conformal geometry. Okay. So you may wonder, you know, what 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 can we say about the set A G, right? So whether this is empty, right? So so first of all, this, this quantity is conformal invariant because we are taking the supremo over all the conformal metrics, so it's conformal invariant. It only depends only depends on conformal class. Okay. And also the set of A, that you know, the the the, uh, the scalar curvature of the new metric is zero. It's not empty if and only if the first eigenvalue of the conformal Laplacian is positive. Okay, so here you have an operator so with the traditional boundary condition. So this uh, this operator is uh, self-adjoint. You can think about first eigenvalue. The eigenvalue. So if the first eigenvalue is uh, uh, positive, then the set is not empty, and vice versa. Okay, this is if and only if. Okay. And moreover, uh, the positivity of this operator does not depend on the choice of the metric. Okay. If you change it to another conformal metric, it's still positive. Okay. So all these quantity I'm mentioning are conformally invariant. So th this should be the right thing. Okay. If you are working in conformal class, you mention some quantity which is not a conformal invariant, then that's not good. Okay. okay. So, and then all the work should, you know, under the framework saying, you know, the first eigenvalue is uh, positive. Okay. Well, this can be achievable because, for example, if the scalar curvature is not negative, then it's automatically positive. Right. So it's it's a large class, not just a small. Okay. So, so what are we gonna do, right? How to do that? So, <clears throat> so you give me a positive function v on the boundary, okay? I want to do a, a Poisson extension, okay? The Poisson extension, the Poisson kernel is, you know, the, is res, with respect to the conformal Laplacian LG, okay? So, but that's because LG is Laplacian plus the perturbation, okay? The self joint, so everything is fine. So. And then you, you can re reformulate it as, you know, you give me a function on the boundary, okay, I do a postal extension, okay, 
And then you consider the ratio, you know, the, uh, the, the L, the L, 2n over n minus 2 norm divided by, you know, the other norm. And you have a different power because of the scaling. Again, this quantity should be scaling invariant, right? Okay. So the quantity, uh, the study is this quantity, the supremum of this uh, ratio of two uh, LP norms, okay? Okay. So, uh, so by the way, you know, you, you, you also, you always, you should always think of V as non-negative because if on the boundary V change the sign, you take the absolute value, you do a post extension, which will be bigger, so you take the supremum will be bigger. So you, you, don't, you don't need to take, uh, think of the, the uh, sign changing function, okay, by maximum principle. Okay, so assuming the first eigenvalue is uh, non-negative, positive, Okay, and they proved you know, this constant is always bigger than or equal to the isoparametric constant, and it's always finite. And if the first equality is strict, okay, that's the next slide, ne never mind. So, so this proves this. So the, the, the Euclidean case is the uh, worst case, okay, Euclidean case is the worst case, and they prove it's always bigger than or equal to, okay, and this constant is the uh, best constant uh, best constant of the uh, isoparametric inequality in Euclidean space. Okay, so our manifold will be, uh, is, is will be bigger, okay. And uh, they also show that if the strict inequality holds, then the supremum is achieved, okay. So, so I say, uh, I say a few more words about the strict inequality. So why is this important? Okay, in a few slides. Okay, so they they they, they, uh, they show that first of all, it's always bigger than equal to, and if it's bigger than, then the supremo is achieved. Okay, so which means there exists a minimizer. Okay, and then they made a conjecture saying, okay, so then the problem is reduced to whether so when will the strict inequality is valid, right? So they made a conjecture say, okay, so anything is fine. Okay, without mentioning any examples. Okay. And this is uh, this is related to other problems, so I we, we know why they made such a conjecture, okay? So thing for any uh, three or more dimensional space remaining manifold with boundary, everything is smooth and the first eigenvalue is positive. And if the manifold is not the ball. Because a ball, if if it's a conformative marker to a ball, so it's like a ball, so it will be equal. Okay. If it's not a conformative marker to a ball, then strict inequality holds. Okay. So they, they mentioned that, but you know they didn't have any example at hand. Okay. So this is what we proved. Okay. So we proved that the strict inequality holds. Uh, under the one of the following two conditions, one or the other, okay? So first one, you know, is we need a dimension bigger than or equal to 12. And we assume the boundary has a non-umbilical point. So umbilical, umbilical, which means the second fundamental form is a diagonal with the same eigenvalues, okay? So if uh, the dimension is bigger than or equal to 12 and the boundary has a non-umbilical point, then we have the strict inequality, okay? Or if the boundary is umbilical, which means every point is an umbilical point, this is the complement of the first, but then we need another uh, assumption, the y tensor is not zero at uh, some boundary point, and dimension is bigger than or equal to 10, okay? So I have to say, you know, the, the other, the, 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 these two conditions are very difficult to remove, okay? I see a few words why in a few minutes, uh, but you know, apparently these dimensions are not optimal, okay? And uh, because the competition, so you want to verify some strict inequality, so which means you have to cook up test functions to verify the strict inequalities, okay? And uh, the verification of those quantities is difficult because we are doing integrals. And you will see it involves postal convolution. So eventually you want to calculate some convolution of some function, which is not easy, okay? And the, the um, apparently so dimension not optimal, so it can be reduced, of course. And now I have a 
graduate student, so he was. It's a good a good problem for a graduate student, so he will uh, he's doing that. Okay. So I uh, I say a few words about this problem. Okay. So why is this related to uh, others? Okay. So therefore, this uh, quantity is achieved on these two uh, assumptions. One of the two assumptions. Okay. And uh, here's a corollary. Here's a corollary. If you have a domain, so if you have a domain is a Euclidean space, if the the, the boundary is uh, connected. I want to do this because I don't want the two two piece of disconnected domain, right? So if the bound is connected, then it's uh, if it's umbilic, uh, unless it if it's umbilic, it has to be a ball. So so uh, if it's uh, not a ball, so it has to be a, it has to have a non umbilical point. So as long as the dimension is bigger than twelve, so it's fine. Okay. And at the same time, uh, uh, Zhu Meiji and uh, Matthew Glatt. Standard ball. Standard standard ball. Okay. Yeah, standard ball. But as long if you know, if you have a conformal diffeomorphic, it's the same thing. You can pull back. Okay. So at the same time, so Zhu and Matthew Gluck, they verify the strict inequality when and uh, it's uh, sim not simply connected. It have a ball subtract a small ball when if epsilon is sufficiently small okay, in all dimensions. Okay. So uh, our result is uh, one does not cover the other at all. Okay, so we didn't cover the S, the S, okay. So they only can do balls in the Euclidean space, uh, annulus, you know, balls subject a small one inside, and uh, for epsilon sufficiently small. Okay. So, okay. So this okay. problem, yeah. Minimum personal dependent topology of a manifold or the... Hey, I don't know. If, if there will be topology quantity involved, that would be great. So their, their computation is also you could couple test function somehow their function works in this annular and annulus. Yeah. It's not because it's not because of it's not simply connected. It's because of the structure somehow they can have a function. Yeah. So so you know it's, it's, uh, well, well, I have I have been talking about conformal, you know, mentioned these words several times. So this this problem is uh, has long history, which dates back to Yamabi, okay, in 1950. Okay, so Yamabi proposed a problem saying, you give me a compact Riemannian manifold without a boundary, okay, you give me this, so uh, whether I can find a conformal metric so that the scalar coverage of the conformal metric is constant. This is a famous Yamabi problem. Why has it become famous? Because Yamabi made a mistake in his original proof, okay. So uh, then Schrodinger, followed by the work of Schrodinger, Aubin, and Rick Schoen, uh, finally completed the whole, 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 whole proof, cost uh, 24 years. Okay. So, so this is the Yamabe problem. So find a conformal metric of constant scalar curvature are compact manifold without boundary. Okay. And there's also a so-called a boundary Yamabe problem, which means now you can see the manifold with boundary. Okay, then you can propose you know the scalar curvature and the mean curvature on the boundary. Okay, both of them are, you know has conformal invariance. Okay, this was initiated by uh, Oscobar, okay, and Marcus and his students. Basically, they want to find a scalar flat conformal metric with constant mean curvature on the boundary. Okay, this is a boundary Yamabe. So now inside the, 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 uh, the scalar curvature is zero, on the boundary the mean curvature is constant. Okay. So these two problems were reduced to solve a semi-linear PDE. But the PDE, although it's semi-linear, but it's a critical solvable exponent. So we will lose a, a solvable compact embedding, and that's where uh, Yamabe made the mistake. Okay. Basically, Yamabe proof cannot be fixed, so they have to cook up something else. Okay. So, so we have the, this, this. Basically, so this triangle tells everything. Okay. So you have three spaces. So H one. Okay. Here H one, and you have the solvable embedding to L two n over minus two. Okay. And you have the trace. Okay, H1 and trace to become H1 half, so you have the solvable embedding on the boundary as well. And then if you do the Poisson extension, you give me a function which is in L2 minus 1 over minus 2, 
you do you do a Poisson extension, harmonic extension, you will have the you will control the norm. Uh, sorry, you will control the norm of L two and one minus two. Okay. So you have this uh, triangle diagram. Okay. And this triangle diagram, so these three three extension or restriction uh, is just related to the next to, to the three program I just mentioned. The first one, you have the Sobolev embedding, right? H1 to L2 over minus 2. And the, the best constant of Sobolev inequality plays a crucial role in the Yamabe problem. Okay, that was the, discover, uh, of this, the discovery of uh, Oban. Okay, I think his work is really fundamental. Okay. So he said, okay, if you have the functional, if the supremo, or if the infimo is strictly less than the best Sobolev constant, then it's achieved. And uh, then the job is to find a test function to verify the strict inequality. So that's where the, the whole story comes from. Okay. This is by the work of Alba. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so this embedding is critical in the Yamabe problem. Okay. And the, the, the trace, okay, is corresponding to the boundary Yamabe problem. Okay. And then, of course, the last piece, right, the last piece, the Poisson extension. This was the inequality found, uh, proved by Han uh, von Bohr, Wang Xiaodong, Yan Xiaodong. Okay, and uh, this, this, uh, so this quantity proved low in in the uh, in the isoperimetric ratio problem. Okay, so you know, this was a joke by uh, one of my friends. Say, ah, your job is trivial, right? Your job is just complete the square by Pythagorean theorem. Okay. I'm, I'm just doing the last piece, you know, the last piece of triangle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Poisson extension, harmonic extension, same thing, right? Yeah, this is this is a, this is a harmonic extension. Okay. Ah, the same thing. Yeah, same okay. thing. Yeah. Okay. Give me a function, a uh, harmonic okay. extension. But why you use different kind of uh, terminology? Sometimes Poisson, sometimes harmonic extension. <laughs> why? Yeah. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> 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 My bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah, I should be consistent, yeah. Okay, so here's some difference, okay, between this, uh, the, you know, the, the isoparametric ratio and the Sobolev, uh, or the Yamabe, or boundary Yamabe, okay. So one of them is, uh, one, one big difference, like, uh, this problem is highly non-local, okay. So, in the other two problems, you will usually you know, find a function, you, you differentiate it because you want to evaluate the H1 norm, right? You give me a function, I take the gradient, I integrate, okay? But here we are doing the opposite. You give me a function, I do Poisson convolu uh, convolution to find the harmonic extension. This is like a convolutional type. You want to calculate the integrals, which is difficult than, more difficult than taking derivative, right? We know that, okay? And, uh, and you can see from the the, the Euler Lagrange equation of this problem, okay, if you want to find the minimizer, the minimizer will satisfy the Euler Lagrange equation, and uh, you will see that so you do a. Uh, so you can see from this, this you do Poisson convolution twice, which is uh, not easy at all. Okay. And it's not a due problem for some any uh, elliptic PDE because sometimes if you give me integral equation which is like a due equation of PDE, for example Laplace equals F, you can say U equals the green function compose uh, convolute with F, right? This is a due problem to the convolution uh, to the harmonic equation, but here's not. Okay. Okay. So here's some related work. Okay. So okay. So. I have been talking about a half an hour, so uh, so the rest of the talk is just the details of the proof. Okay, a few first few slides is to explain the idea and the difficult. So the last few slides is, you know, we will see if we have time to to go through. Okay, so let's recall the problem. Okay, the problem is uh, you want to maximize the isoparametric ratio. Okay. And the V is on the boundary, V is not zero. You can think of V positive as I mentioned. Okay. And uh, you want to verify uh, the strict uh, verify the strict inequality, right? Then you need to cook up uh, a test function. Right? You want to cook up a test function to plug in to verify it. So the test function, the only thing we have, okay, so is the minimizer in the Euclidean ball. 
Okay, this is, a, this is our only first shot, right? If this doesn't work, we think of others. This is our first shot because uh, in that case, so we know what's happening on the Euclidean ball, and we are going to compare it with the Euclidean ball. So that's why we take the minimizer of the Euclidean ball, plug in whether we can gain something, right? So okay, then because here we are on a manifold, right? Manifold, what are we going to do, right? Then we have to rescale the bubble, right? So, the, you know, it's locally, and the manifold is like a Euclidean space, but with some curvature, you can do a tail expansion. So that's why we have to scale the bubble. So the bubble is supported in a small region, and in this small region, we can expand the manifold in local coordinates so that we can compute, okay? So we have to rescale the bubble, okay? And then we cut it off, okay? This is a test function. And the difficult is apparently so uh, the, the, the V is uh, the v, the v will be explicit. This is a minimizer of the Euclidean ball case, so we know what it is. Okay, and we cut it off. We can calculate that the denominator is not difficult at all. Well, the difficult part is you want to estimate the numerator. You have to do a harmonic extension or Poisson extension and the calculate the norm. Okay, and then okay. Uh, so and then we 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 did it is by uh, so this is, so this Poisson extend this uh, Poisson extension is with respect to conformal Laplacian. Okay, you have uh, the scalar curvature term. You have the small perturbation there. Okay, then we so the naive case is okay. So we know how to calculate the harmonic extension in Euclidean space. Okay, but here the, the perturbation of the harmonic. So we just take the difference whether we can see how to cal uh, control the error. Okay, this we do. Okay, and the intuitive way is okay. So you have you know do harmonic extension or Poisson extension. So we know what is a Poisson kernel. Okay, and then if you know the Poisson kernel in on the manifold, you can compare the difference of Poisson kernel. You can calculate the error. So that's the first shot, right? So this is actually so this this uh, this way also uh, somehow uh, uh, mentioned in. In the original paper by you know Han Fengbo, Wang Xiaodong, Ye Xiaodong, okay, in one of their sections they are trying uh, to you know expand the Poisson kernel on the remaining manifold, but uh, mm, so we don't know how to do this, okay. So apparently we don't know how to do this, but nevertheless this is a very interesting problem, okay. So what is the Poisson kernel on the manifold? So what's the asymptotic expansion? Okay, it's a very interesting problem, but. Uh, but for, for this particular problem, we don't know how to do that, okay? So we did it uh, in a different way, okay? So we, we, we are not able to accomplish it, okay? So we did it in a way like uh, we write in a PDE and then we uh, expand it into three terms. So we do a tele expansion until the third term and then the last term will uh, for, and the fourth term and so on will be the error, okay? And uh, each of them will satisfy a second order equation. Okay, I s as we'll see this later. Okay, so the first term will can be calculated explicitly. Okay, and then we need some luck for that, right? You will calculate the convolution. We need some luck to find the function explicitly. Okay, so the first term can be uh, calculated explicitly, and this will give us the strict inequality under the assumption of our theorem in the dimension and uh, non applicable point, and so on, okay? So the first one will give us, uh, will, be, will verify the strict inequality under our assumption of the theorem, okay? Now the second term is the same as the first term. However, uh, we are not able to calculate explicitly, but we can show it's positive, okay? So it's harmless, at least. And the second step, in the second step, it's possible to reduce the dimension. We just throw it away. We, we don't know how to calculate it. We only can show it's positive, okay? And the third term is high order and it's negligible. So we don't have to, we don't need to take care of the fourth order term because it's negligible as well. So the second term depends on the focus geometry of a boundary? Yeah. Uh, both the first term and the second term. But somehow, for the first term, we can calculate the explicitly, so we can calculate the, what's the exact contribution. Mm -hmm. But the second term, we could not. Yeah. It's maybe because of our method, you know, we, we lost, we lose something here. Yeah. 
So looking at the, some local data, it, it looks like uh, some fractional Laplacian. Uh, no, this is not the fractional Laplacian. Okay, so you have a harmonic expansion. So if you consider a flat. Yeah, then if you restrict it back to the boundary, then that's half Laplacian. But we are working the whole domain, not only on the boundary. Yeah, sure, sure. But so, so I'm saying that you look locally, looking very similar to the fractional. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's I agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, and for second term, if it, if it is zero, what's the meaning of it? So, okay. So this is uh, from our computation. So, so, so. So, for example, in our first assumption, saying it has a non abelic point, which means the uh, trace list second fundamental form is uh, not zero. Mm -hmm. So, the both the first term and the second term, there will be this quantity norm square in front of both. Okay, but we the, on the first we know what's the coefficient in front of that, but for the second we don't know what's the coefficient in front of it. So we uh, so we lose something here. Yeah. This is from the computation wise, and just for our method. I'm not saying this is a universal way, this, but just we figured out a way to uh, give some result. Okay. Okay, so now the rest of the <laughs> slides is some uh, detailed. What's my time? 20 minutes, okay. So, you know, if you are getting exhausted, so it's okay, you can skip this, okay? This is a little bit uh, evolved, okay? So, so it's our remaining manifold, so what we can do is, okay, we choose a small neighborhood, and right? we do an expansion of everything, okay? And so this, this, this function, so this ratio, lambda over lambda squared plus x prime squared to this power, so this is a minimizer for the Euclidean ball case, okay? And, uh, this function, you have xn plus lambda square, so this is a harmonic extension of this function in the ball. Uh, not ball, okay, in ha ha half plane, okay. Because the ball is the same as half plane, you do a conformal change, the ball is the same as half plane. Okay. So, so, so this is minimized for the half space, and this is the uh, Poisson extension of this function, harmonic extension of this function, okay. So, so locally, you can choose a coordinate, so on the boundary, the center of the boundary to the expansion of the local coordinate, okay? So you choose the minimizer of, of the half space, you cut it off, okay? So, so this is a test function on the boundary. Then you do a Poisson extension, which is small u lambda. This capital u lambda is the extension of it in the whole half space, okay? So apparently what we need is to estimate the error because we are comparing the ratio to the Euclidean ball case. Okay. So we want to compare the difference and so that uh, we will see how much we lose again. Okay. Okay, so so uh, here first the first we choose uh, the Q is uh, cube, okay? You know, we, we don't like cube because we need to uh, do some estimate. The cube, you know, the domain is Lipschitz. We don't want to do that. So we, 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 we you know, in two cubes, we find the rotationally symmetric smooth domain, okay? Because I, I, otherwise, I need to do estimate on the corner of the cube, which is uh, not good. So we, we, we try to avoid it, okay? That will be universal, so it's okay. Okay, this is just a technical assumption, okay? Okay, so how to find the error? So here you want to find a W lambda. So W lambda is error. How to do that? Okay. So for our, for us, we write on the PD of W and try to estimate it. Okay. So what would be the PD for W? So we have a PD for U lambda, small U lambda. And you just plug in, so you will have a PD. So it is what it is. We don't lose, we don't lose or gain anything here. Okay. So W lambda, the capital W lambda is error. And we want to find what's the error. Give an estimate of this, and you plug in to calculate the ratio. Okay. And uh, so this is the equation. We didn't lose anything. We just plug in, so it is what it is. Okay. And then we want to find the. Uh, we want to estimate the capital lambda. Okay. Then how to do this? We keep ex expanding the equation. Okay. 
So lambda will be a parameter. In the end, we will let lambda go to uh, zero. Okay. So so v lambda is our test function. Is the cut off the standard bubble. Okay. And uh, so u lambda is a Poisson extension on the Euclidean space uh, on the manifold. Okay. So. So V lambda is a bubble on the boundary. So the first, there's nothing to calculate for the denominator. As I mentioned before, there's the difficult to calculate the numerator. Okay, numerator is a Poisson extension of the uh, small V lambda, and the U lambda. Excuse me. Yeah. I thought M is a general uh, sort of uh, uh, manifold. Manifold. I mean, how do, how do you go to uh, this? Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because we cut it off. Uh -huh. We cut it off. Okay. So I'll V, uh, we, so V, so we, uh, we cut it off. Oh, okay. uh, all of a I don't care. Okay, yeah. okay. It's okay. zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, otherwise it wouldn't match, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just a local yeah. thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Good point, yeah. Okay. Uh, but so V, we cut it off, but we do Poisson extensions, it's still, still somewhere, right? So it's not, it's not zero, somewhere it's still positive. So difficult to calculate small u lambda to some power, take the integral, okay? So u lambda, small u lambda is capital U lambda plus uh, w lambda. So w lambda is error, w lambda satisfies PDE, okay? Keep in mind, so w is error, and this satisfies PDE. The so PDE coming from u lambda, okay? And then you expand it, okay? So you figure out, this is just Taylor expansion, saying, oh, okay, the first thing, first term is the uh, will match this to become the Euclidean ball case, okay? And then you have uh, the second term and the third term, and uh, the other term you will form the scaling, so that the first two terms have the same order, lambda square, and later on will be lambda to the fourth, okay? So if you choose lambda small enough, the rest of it is negligible, and only the, first, only the middle two uh, matters, okay? So now the job is you want to calculate the, the these two integral. Basically, you calculate this integral and this integral, okay? And to find what the capital lambda will be when the lambda goes to zero. Okay, so we will show that this is not only bigger than zero, but only, you know, give us uh, a really good, uh, it's a positive uh, contribution plus lambda square under the assumption of our theorem. Okay. So keep in mind, so this is what we are going to, to, to show. So recall, so capital U lambda is set by this PDE, okay? So the PDE here, again, we don't lose anything. This PDE coming from the PDE of small u, okay? Because you small u, we know LG u lambda equals zero, then you plug in it, it's what it is, okay? Okay, so, so, and then we, <coughs> so, Okay, so you have th this is PDE, this is boundary condition, okay? On the one, f the flat boundary condition zero, on the curve, the boundary condition is a lower order term. So, so, so the PDE can be summarized as this, okay? And then you want to give estimate of this solution of PDE, what are we gonna do, right? Okay, we give uh, approximation of the equation, where we throw away some lower order term of the equation, Okay, then you may have, you may capture the leading order of the solution, okay. So, okay, we make it easier. So we take the Laplacian, okay. So this W1 lambda will be the leading term of uh, W lambda, at least one of the leading terms, okay. And then you keep doing that. You, f you, you, you capture the W1 lambda, what is left, you write down the PD again, you capture another term, write down the PD again, you write, and then you plug in again, you capture the P, uh, leading term again. So eventually you will have three terms, okay? You decompose the error into three terms, and each of them will satisfy PDE, okay? Okay. So this turns out, you know, W1, W2 are the same order, but W3 is negligible, okay? So we only need to take care of W1 and W2, okay? From here, uh, Okay, so you expand it, this expansion of, so this two quantity is what we need to estimate, and if you plug in W1, W2, W3, W3 will be gone. Okay, W3 will be gone, okay. So only W1, W2 left. 
So for, for this quantity, the W2 is also gone, only W1 matters. Okay. But for, for that, so W1, W2 matters, so W3 is gone. So we, we need, and then two quantities is reduced to these uh, three quantities. Okay. And it turns out, so the first we can calculate explicitly, and the other two we are not able to calculate, but we show is positive. So we need to estimate the three terms, okay? So uh, I'll just do one case because the other can do similarly, okay? Again, now I'm belief, which means the trace the second and fundamental form does not vanish because eventually this three quantity will involve H square. Okay, this three quantity will involve H square. Where they come from? They come from the expansion of the metric. Okay, the H coming from the Taylor expansion of the metric at that point. Okay, if you expand a high order enough, H will show up. Okay, so uh, let me do quickly, okay. So calculate the first, okay. You can forget about all this. So you want lambda go to zero. You lambda go to zero, it's like the domain going to the half space, okay. So this will, lambda, lambda square will be the scaling of the quantity, and the H will show up, okay. And this quantity, F will, small f will be explicit, Okay, small f is from the leading term of the of this quantity, and uh, something which is difficult in general is the uh, uh, Poisson extension of some given function on the boundary. Okay, and uh, luckily, okay, so we we can calculate what is this quantity, and f will be explicit as long as uh, as long as we know what is this explicitly, we are plug in to calculate the limit. Okay, calculate the integral, sorry. Okay, so here uh, we, uh, we, we were lucky that we have this explicit uh, calculation. Okay, so, so uh, the g, g is the po uh, green function for the half space. Okay, so this is the only term we know how to calculate explicitly. Okay, and so for example, the other ones, Okay, somehow it involves, this is fine, but somehow something, some crazy show up. Okay, some crazy show up, uh, so basically you want to find the V which will satisfy this PDE. Okay, V, is eventually you want to find a quantity V, a function V satisfy this uh, equation. And this equation, you, if you write it in, in harmonic sense, so you have uh, Laplace equals this function in Rn plus four, Plus the half space, you increase four dimension higher in the half space. Okay, but uh, unfortunately we are not able to solve this equation explicitly. That's where we lose something. Okay. So and of course we don't need to solve v explicitly. We can find the lower bound is also enough. But we tried very hard. Any lower bound we can find is helpless to improve the dimension assumption. Okay. Okay. Why this is two-dimensional? Why is it just R and S? Oh, because symmetric. Oh, you impose symmetric? Because, uh, yes, yeah, because, uh, you know, we, we, we restrict it to the cubic. Oh, okay. we, we do a domain which is symmetric. There will be a lot of cancellation oh. in, in, in X prime direction. So only X prime absolute value and uh, the Z, Z, Z direction. Yeah. That's why you wanted only two, two, two involved. Okay. Okay. So V is V is bigger than zero by maximum principle, uh, but we don't know how to compute V or V cubed uh, explicitly. This is the place where we lose, okay? A and so this, this is uh, uh, one of the two terms we need to calculate. So the first term will be explicit, and the second term is positive, so it's harmless, okay? And uh, the, th the third, th the other term is the same thing eventually, uh, so this quantity evolved the same unexpressed v. So if we know what is v, we can plug into calculate, but we still don't know how to do that. And any lower bound we can find is still helpless to reduce the di dimension assumption. Okay. So for the umbilical case, which means the second fundamental form is exactly diagonal with the same eigenvalues, then we need to expand the coordinate in higher order, okay. Originally, maybe fourth order expansion is enough, but here maybe you need eighth, okay. 
Okay. So the calculation is a little bit more evolved than the previous one. Okay. Uh, Amplic case is always more dedicated than non amplitude case. So you need some constraint for the space engine. So yes. Come you know, this is the same thing like in the Orban recursion case, right? This is because of the test function. So in Obama, he used a uh, minimizer for the solid inequality. He plug in, he can only show dimension bigger than s equal to six. Right? Okay. This is because of the test assumption. So all this, uh, all this assumption, I, I, uh, we, we assumed is because of our uh, test function. Because of the test function only gives us this. So in your estimation, first term, you don't need that uh, constraint. But yeah. the second term and the third term, maybe you need. So we lose there. We lose. Uh, we don't know how to calculate. We just throw it away. It's harmless. <coughs> it's positive. But for the, the estimation of the second term, you need some the restriction for the space dimension. Oh, the restriction of space oh, is just coming from the first, we, which is explicit. Oh, first. Yeah, the explicit one, we know a dimension bigger than or equal to 12. We know it's positive. But the third, uh, second, and third is always positive. We just uh, throw it away. So the dimension of something comes from the first. Okay. This is because of our, of our calculation, <coughs> the way we calculate it, and also because of our test function. Okay. Apparently, this can be improved, I'm sure. So 12 coming from blue. Why is 12? So here, you just use the local property. Local property. For the Yamai property. Of course. Yeah. So That's true. Unique. That's true. So the test function will be diff different. Yeah. So for the umbilical case, it's even uh, even even more delicate. Okay, so, uh, thank you. <laughs>